Good evening and a warm welcome to another Crossroads Bible Study. My name is Odran Skuman, you're from Jadnil, and it's a privilege for me once again to be with you tonight. And we've been discussing apologetics, and tonight we're going to look at the problem of evil. Now, this is a, a very important subject for me personally because I, I, we know that we're always confronted with evil. Uh, we see it in the news, we see it all around us. And this brings forth questions that needs answering. And uh, these same questions unbelievers are also uh, um, confronted with. And sometimes they look at Christians to answer these difficult questions. And, and uh, they, want, they want answers. And we will be looking at the Word of God in, in, in trying to answer these difficult questions of life. So before we continue, let us just pray together. Father, thank you once again for another Crossroads Bible study that we can be gathered again in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you will lead us in spirit and truth. Thank you that you will help me, Father, and those listening, so we might receive what your spirit wants to tell us tonight. And may we learn from this, may we grow through this, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what is the problem? Why do bad things happen to good people? This always has been and always will be one of the greatest questions in life. Why do the innocent suffer? Why are babies born with deformalities? Why does God allow natural catastrophes, social injustice and political corruption? The dilemma becomes more acute when one factors in faith in an all-powerful, all-wise God. If God is all-wise, He must have foreseen the fall. Why then did He allow why didn't they create excuse me, a world that was destined to, to produce so much suffering? If God is all-powerful and all-good, He must have the desire and the ability to put an end to evil. Why then does He allow sin and suffering to continue? Perhaps God does not exist, we can reason. We're still, perhaps He does exist, but He does not have the power to eliminate evil. Paul Little states the problem this way. And the classic statement of the problem, either God is all-powerful but not all-good and therefore doesn't stop evil, or He is all-good but, but unable to stop evil, in which case He is not all-powerful. All too often man's instinctive response is to blame God for his misfortunes and his hardships. We're so used to when things aren't going our way, we blame God for it. And so also the unbeliever uh, we see so much hurt in people's lives and they have questions towards God, even if they do not believe in Him, interestingly enough. For the biblical Christian, blaming God is not an option because the Bible says that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Now we know that everything works good for those who love God and who trust God. So we can put our trust in that, but in this lesson we're going to probe some of the reasons God allows suffering in the world. We do not pretend to have all the answers, of course, but we know in part why God allows bad things to happen, because He has revealed some of the reasons in His Word. So why did God allow evil to enter the world? Why did an all-powerful, all-wise God create a world full of evil? It's a difficult question, but... The first point we must bear in mind is that God created the world perfect, without sin or evil. He did not create a fallen world, just one with the possibility of a fall. He gave us the freedom of choice. If man had not rebelled against God, he would have lived in a perfect fellowship with Him for all eternity, free of sin, suffering, grief, hardship or loss. Even though the Lord knew the world would fall, He Himself did not cause the fall. Neither was He in any way responsible for it. This raises another problem. Even if God did not create a world full of evil, He created a world that He knew would fall. He had the power to prevent it, but He did not. Why did He allow the problem, the world to fall? This does not make God ultimately responsible for creating evil. No, not at all. God created the world with the possibility of evil because He wanted creation, especially man, to love and to worship Him voluntarily. 
in order to love him voluntarily, man had to be uh, created with genuine freedom, excuse me, of choice. Freedom to be real must be uh, freedom to, to choose opposites, to reject God. If man did not have the real freedom to do either good or evil, he would have been little more than a robot programmed to love God. God did not want robots to worship him. He wanted free, voluntary, loving worship. Therefore, he had to create a world with the possibility of evil. All evil in this world is ultimately due to man's misuse of his freedom. His sin against God. This is the second point we must remember. People are responsible for sin, not God. Why does God allow evil to continue in the world then? Since God has the power to put an end to all evil, He chooses not to. Are we to conclude that He con uh, condones it and thereby becomes re responsible for it? Certainly not. So why does God not destroy all evil? This question is often asked with reference to the devil and his demons. Why doesn't God just destroy the devil? However, it is not only the devil that God would have to destroy. If God were to destroy evil, he would have to be completely consistent. That is, he would have to destroy all evil, every living thing that is not perfectly holy. If God were to execute perfect justice right now, he could not limit it to the devil, but would have to condemn all sinners alike. How many people would be exempt? God can destroy all evil and will destroy evil completely. A judgment day is set on, the, on which the Lord will destroy evil and establish perfect, perfect justice worldwide. Let us never forget, however, that we ourselves only escape judgment because of His grace. If He were to treat us as on our merits, of course, we would, we would fare a little better than the devil before sin. In the midst of personal suffering, cry out for God to destroy all evil. Let us remember that we too are deserving of judgment, not all, not of salvation. In response to those who ask why the Lord was uh, taking so long to return and establish the kingdom of God in righteousness, Peter replied in the following in 2 Peter 3 verse 7 to 10. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. God delays establishing perfect justice on earth because he has compassion on the lost for whom the day of judgment will bring eternal suffering. The time will come when he will punish all of evil and reward all good. But that day will be a terrible day for mankind. How does evil serve the purpose of God is another question. The basic Christian view of suffering is that God uses evil to bring about good. Evil and suffering are instruments God uses to bring about a greater good. This principle is taught several times in scriptures. The classic statement is Paul's declaration in Romans 8 verse 28. And we know that all things in all things God works for those for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. The classic example is Joseph's response to his brothers after they betrayed him and sold him into slavery in Genesis 50 verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. How does God use evil to bring about greater good? Bernard Ram mentions some ways that evil can be an instrument for human good. Now, evil helps us 
appreciate good. Just as a person does not appreciate the th relief morphine brings until he has suffered intense pain, so we can only appreciate good because we know evil. If it were not for the presence of evil in the world, we would take good for granted. Perhaps this is why the tree uh, Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat from was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Although all that they experienced as a result of eating it from it was evil, they acquired knowledge or good and evil because of good and evil, because by suffering evil, they came to appreciate good by contrasting it with evil. Evil helps us appreciate God's glory. John Calvin believed that all that is done in the world is done for the glory of God. God has decreed this whole world ordered to reveal and promote his glory and also his love and compassion for man. Hence, evil functions strictly instrumentally and is never out of the control of God. As the foil of God, evil is instrumental in revealing God's glory. What does this mean? Without the presence of evil in the world, creation would not serve as an adequate revelation of God's glory and goodness. Without the fall, all we would understand of God would be His power and His majesty. However, because of the fall, we can now appreciate His love, mercy and grace in saving sinners and His justice and holiness in punishing evildoers. As we see God at work to undo the effective, the effects of, of the fall, we can, can come to appreciate Him more. Thus, God is now is glorified by the presence of evil in the world. And if we think about Jesus suffering on the cross for us, how he revealed his love towards us, there is no God like the God we serve who would come down as a man to die for our sins and revealing a love that we cannot yet fully understand. What has God done about evil? When we are hard pressed on every side and our world is falling apart, we often wonder why God does not intervene for us. We may even question his love for us. We think to ourselves, if God loves me, why doesn't he help me? As we look at all the suffering around us, we may be, we may be forgiven for wondering if God cares about us. However, God has done something tangible about this problem of evil. He has sent his, only, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us for, for the sins of the world. Calvary is this supreme demonstration of God's love for us. If ever we feel tempted to question the genuineness of His love for us, all we need to, to, be remind, uh, to do is remind ourselves of the cross. When we cry out to God for the reasons for our suffering and He does not answer, it is not because He does not care, but because His final word has already been spoken, the cross of Calvary. The Apostle Paul wrestled with this significance of the cross in Romans 8 he con conceded that Christians suffers many hard Christians suffer many hardships but argued that the cross was mightier than them all since Christ died for us nothing can call his love into question and nothing can separate us from his love though many things will try in Romans 8 verse 32 to 39 it says the following what then shall we say in response to this if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge to those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died more than that? Who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death or, nor life, neither angels or, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. One writer compared looking at the cross to looking at a rug 
through a magnifying glass. At the center, the rug looks smooth and flawless, but around the edges it appears blurred. Nevertheless, we know it is flawless all around because of what we see in the center. In the same way, we know that God's love for us is perfect because of what happened at Calvary. Even though our circumstances might cause His love to seem imperfect at times. Bernard Ramps, Ram puts it well. Incidents of evil call into question the love and goodness of God. The cross is not an explanation of evil or a resolve of the problem of evil, but the answer to the question. In Christ and His cross, the goodness and love of God is apparent. And therefore, in those terrible tragedies where God seems silent and absent, Christian man is not disturbed at his foundation, even though he too may have his spasms of perplexity and doubt. The love of and goodness of the cross is greater is the greater assurance of God's love than any conceivable tragedy that can be a denial of that love and goodness. This then ends tonight's Bible study, the first part of the problem of evil, and tomorrow night we'll be looking at part two. And uh, I hope that you are strengthened by this and that some of the questions that you might have been wrestling with have been answered. And hopefully tomorrow night we will answer even more questions. Let us pray. Father, thank you that we could have uh, looked at your word and and uh, and the, our hope is, Lord, that some of the difficult questions that we've been wrestling with have been answered, Lord, to give us peace in this. And may your word keep on strengthening us. May it give us the answers that we need desperately, Lord, because your word does speak to us in these difficult times. I pray this for each and everyone listening tonight, Lord. May you bless them. May the Holy Spirit uh, uh, lead them, Lord. May it comfort them in these times. And we pray this alone in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for the spending the time with us tonight. We hope you have a blessed evening and a good night's rest. Goodbye.